When I polled our listener community about our top requests for outdoor garden-related episodes, oh my gosh, this one far surpassed every other type of request. Oof! It wasn't managing fertilizer. It wasn't succession planting or garden design. It was how to manage pesky animals getting into your gardens, which is so funny because it's not even about the process of growing. It's the process about protecting what you're growing. I got to tell you, plant friends, being a city girl, I had no concept of this true struggle besides like the pigeons that repetitively tried to nest under our raised bed on our tiny balcony garden last year. But as I dove into this process of garden planting in our first home upstate and asking all of my new local plant friends about their advice, everyone I talked to said, you got to figure out a plan for managing deer and you need a fence. <laughs> My next door neighbor shared that the voles last year were the bane of her existence. And many members of our community actually share with me that they've given up their garden dreams because they just couldn't figure out how to deer proof their landscapes. Well, plant friends, today is the answer to our prayers because Brie from BrieGrows.com gives us such an amazing comprehensive list of practices and solutions for managing every type of garden pest you could imagine. And we really shouldn't call them garden pests, but they're the animals whose land that we're living on. Brie is the coolest person. I've totally made her my plant friend after meeting her in this interview, and she just breaks down squirrels, chipmunks, moles, voles, shrews, deer, oh my, <laughs> so many more. So without further ado, I hope this answers so many of your questions and can't wait to hear what you think. Welcome to episode 123 of Blue Mangrove. Okay, plant friends, it's no secret if you've been following me on Instagram that I am obsessed with the wildlife <laughs> here in upstate New York where Billy and I are living. Just last week, I saw my first IRL porcupine. I had never seen one. It was crossing the street. It had the cutest waddle. Oh my God, it was amazing. It's pinned on my Instagram stories. Actually, Animal Watch is pinned on my Instagram stories if you guys want to see my adventures with wildlife while I'm up here. But seeing that porcupine, once again, like just went to enforce how important this episode is. And we see deer like two to three times a day up here. It's so great. Bree's so amazing. And special thanks to our newest Patreon plan friends. We've got a few of you. Michael, Michael Hyde came in over the normal $4 price. So thank you, sir. And Lauren and Mike, thank you so much for joining our Patreon supporters. You can click the link in the show notes to learn more about them. I love this community. I'm so excited for what our community is going to grow and evolve into this year. Okay, plant friends, Brie seriously is so awesome. I kind of fell in love with her in this conversation, and I hope that you fall in love with her too throughout all of the amazing info she gives us. So here's Brie. Brie, I'm so excited to finally have you on Bloom and Grow Radio. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. Oh my gosh, you're such a like beacon in the gardening world. And I've known about you for a while. And Leslie Halleck is a really good mutual friend of ours. We met briefly at Cultivate in 2019. And I can't believe it's taken me this long to have you on the show. So thank you for your patience and your, your generosity with coming on. Well, you are so welcome. And it's an, an honor to be included in your guest list. Oh my God, <laughs> it's an honor to have you. And I'm so excited to have you as part of my first garden series on the podcast because we've spoken a little bit about how I'm really struggling with figuring out this pest management thing. You know, I've gone from a tiny little balcony garden that I've done in containers. Now I'm on five acres in the middle of bear country. So I'm really excited about this particular topic. And I've had so many listeners write in asking about deer and voles and moles and squirrels and pests. So before we dive in, I'd love to know a little bit about Brie, the plant lady of Brie Grows. And how did you become the Brie of Brie Grows? Well, I've been gardening a long time. And so it's Really, all the information that I share with people is well seasoned. You know, it's it's from experience. I'm super good at doing things the wrong way. So me too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a skill, right? Yeah, it is an acquired skill for sure. But you know, I started gardening as a kid growing up in southeastern Michigan. My grandparents and parents both gardened, and I was a member of 4 H. And so oh, I really cool. think that it was those hardworking extension agents that, you know, patiently worked with a bunch of 4 H kids that mm -hmm. encouraged me to follow this passion for plants. And I studied landscape design and horticulture at Purdue. 
and landed in North Carolina first as an intern, as an estate gardener. And then after I graduated, I came full time and it's 19 years have passed. I can't believe that almost two decades have disappeared. I've been in zone seven, central North Carolina, working in various capacities. Primarily, my background is in production of ornamental plants. So I spent many years as a propagator and grower at different nurseries, specializing really in rare and unusual stuff, things that are in the mail order market. So we Mm -hmm. could ship nationwide and at Plant Delights globally, getting, you know, all the plant nerds their fix for weird things. So my background in horticulture led me to being a home gardener. And that's what I focus on now is communications to consumers in horticulture so they have a better growing experience. And you have a couple of books, one just recently out, right? I do. I have two books. Actually, I have them next to me. (laughs) The Foodscape Revolution, which came out a few years ago, and Gardening with Grains. And Mm. actually, chapter nine of Gardening with Grains is entirely devoted to animal brows, which is really one of the things that has always been a major question that gardeners Mm -hmm. have posed to me. And their questions have led me to think really critically about logical solutions that are cost effective, that don't make your neighbors mad, that also Mm -hmm. enable you to successfully grow plants. And so when I told my publisher that I needed an entire chapter devoted to, is it deer proof? (laughs) <laughs> they laughed and they they questioned that. And, and then they ultimately said, you know, you probably should write a book just on that topic, but we'll give you a chapter for now. <laughs> right. Hey, that's great. That's your third book deal right there, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I can't wait to ask you if there are deer proof plants later in the interview. But before we dive in, I have to ask, what was your weirdest, most exotic, most favorite plant you ever worked on? Oh, you know, there's been Hard a lot question. But my, I'd say my greatest achievement as a plant propagator was propagating the Asian sassafras, sassafras zumu, and it's sort of notoriously difficult. And I was primarily a cuttings propagator. So rooting mm-hmm. little pieces of plant. So I got it to root, but then more importantly, I got it to go through dormancy and come back to life the next spring. And wow, <laughs> it was Dan Hinckley you know, of Wincliffe and owner of Heronswood wrote me a note to compliment my propagation abilities. And so I always <gasps> think like it's all downhill from there. <laughs> it's my greatest <laughs> achievement. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh my gosh. So you're a horticulturalist specifying in propagation, but now it's so cool that you're able to take that super de duper science, intense knowledge and translate it to dummies like me who just don't have any of it, but still want to nurture these beautiful living things. So thank you. (laughs) Well, absolutely. I mean, I'm glad to be able to translate my years of experience into something that's useful for the average person who doesn't necessarily want to devote their life just to plants, Mm -hmm. but does want to have gardening as a component. And this has been the greatest pleasure of mine, being able to reach so many people over the last few years and working with Joe Lample with Growing a Greener World on Mm -hmm. PBS. It's just been a a really, it's a very satisfying and I'm just very grateful for these opportunities to, you know, get to get to help people so they don't have to make all the same mistakes that I have. Yes, thank you. Please help us. And Joe is a beloved friend of of Bloom and Grow. And I'm actually taking his seed starting course right now in preparation for my garden. (laughs) Oh, awesome. Well, we're doing that course with asexual production together this summer. So So once you get seeds under your belt, you're going to want to learn how to grow from cuttings. Yeah. (laughs) We'll be teaching that class from my yard. (laughs) Oh my God. So cool. All right. Well, we'll have to keep listeners updated about that that at when you guys launch. So, you know, you brought up that it's, you know, it lights you up to help gardeners not get discouraged. And it's fun for me right now. I feel like I started this podcast four years ago as a houseplant novice through all my interviews. You know, I know a thing or two about houseplants now, but I am truly still a novice when it comes to gardening. And I feel like I'm going through that process all over again. And this is something that I'm hearing. And it's something that I experienced in my mom's garden last year. I don't want to say we made the mistake. We made the choice of putting a lot of bird feeders up because my parents love having birds outside of their office window. But 
what we didn't realize was the bird feeders were going to attract every squirrel in town. And what happened was the squirrels, my mom hand plants like a tomato hedge, like a hedge of like 20 tomato plants. The squirrels scaled the plants and we didn't see one tomato because those damn squirrels ate them all. And then we had rows of uh, Swiss chard and greens and kale. And one day my mom comes inside and she said, you know, it looks like someone plowed the greens. Like it's so bizarre. They're all at the same level. It almost looks like someone mowed the greens over. And we realized that there were these local deer that were literally just like chomping all the greens down. So I think that from what I've heard from our community, like a lot of people get really discouraged by like investing in these plants, taking the time to like cultivate their soil, make sure the soil, you know, is amended planting them up, taking that time and energy and investing, and then a freaking vole just digs it up. It's so true. What the hell? (laughs) It's so true. I always laugh because, you know, I'm like, I don't know how they know how much you paid for a plant, but... Mm -hmm. If you are emotionally connected or have spent a lot of money, they're guaranteed to eat it. I mean, there's just no way around it. It's, you know, the one thing about gardeners and animals, it's something we all have in common. Like over the years of giving presentations around the country, I've always tried to focus on what are what are three things that everyone in this room has in common. We all eat. We all need clean water, right? We all have animals. Yes. <laughs> and some parts of the country have worse animals than others. Mm-hmm. And so I've been actually feeling really privileged in North Carolina that I don't have wild boars like they do mm-hmm. in Texas or elk, <laughs> like they yeah. do, you know, in Montana or bear, like you have. Mm-hmm. Although we actually have had some bear sightings lately. And I don't have any advice on <laughs> bear proofing your garden at all. Oh my! But gosh. we've had one that's been wandering around like an eighth of a mile from my garden. And I'm like, if I see bear prints in my soil, I just don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> right. Oh my God. That's wild. Well, that's an interesting place to start off. So are there any common, do we call them pests? Do we call them animals? What do we call them to start off? Well, I mean, I just call them animals and it's really funny. It's ironic that this was scheduled today. I saw a post this morning from a good friend and fellow author and and wonderful speaker, Nancy Lawson, who wrote a fabulous book called The Humane Gardener. Mm -hmm. And her point really is trying to get people to recognize we're actually the ones that have invaded these animals spaces. Yeah. So yeah. we're coming at this kind of from the wrong approach. Like we have a chip on our shoulder. Well, they should have a chip on their shoulder. We took away their home and then we replaced it with exotic, well-cultivated, irrigated, fertilized salad bars. And then mm-hmm. we wonder why they're eating it. Exactly. We like basically grow food for them basically. Cause they're like, this is my house. You're in my house growing food. I want to eat it. And then we're like, no, you can't eat it. And I totally get that. That's, that's an important reframing that needs to happen. I think when anyone approaches their garden. Well, it is, it's, it's valid to be frustrated And it's also valid to just take a step back and recognize you don't live here alone, whether you think you do or not. Like Mm -hmm. that's just a totally unrealistic expectation. And Mm -hmm. so I don't tend to call them pests. I just, the critters that I share my property with, that I, they help me steward my land, you know, Mm -hmm. as we like to say. And I think that there are some really common animals like squirrels and chipmunks seem to cause trouble for people everywhere. Mm -hmm. Rabbits and groundhogs, Mm -hmm. you know, equally, they both reproduce rapidly. They tend to stay where they are. They don't necessarily move around. They make a home and they stay there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can easily have like groundhogs have twins every spring and they're really cute. Mm -hmm. My dog, when I first moved to North Carolina, used to come to work with me at this large 100 acre estate state and she became friends with the groundhogs Aww. and they would like sit out in the barnyard and sun and roll around and she didn't do anything to keep the groundhogs from digging up our plantings and like groundhogs eat everything so if you have a plant that you're like wait everybody says that the deer don't eat that well it might not be a deer that's the thing right. deer get the real 
slap to the face. You know, like we, we love to blame one animal. I think it's human nature to kind of overly simplify a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case with animal brows, you know, everybody categorizes it as deer. Is it deer proof? How do you, you know, protect yourself against deer? And what I've learned as a person living on the edge of the country where the suburban sprawl is is reaching out, we have a lot of animal pressure here because a lot of the natural lands around us are now being developed. So those animals are losing that home and they're moving into our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just really important to recognize you're going to have different animals in different seasons and every animal has a slightly different diet. And then your strategies for managing all of these different animals are also different. So what you do for deer doesn't actually work on squirrels. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the complication because there isn't like one product that just solves all your problems. If there was, whoever invented it would have been able to retire a million times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Totally. So, you know, it, that's the fun part of it is that you're always going to learn something about these critters that you are coexisting with. Mm -hmm. And I've figured out a few solutions that I'm excited to get to share with you guys. So, yeah, I'm so excited to ask you what works and what doesn't. More importantly, what doesn't work. But before that, I'd love to kind of profile some of these critters that we all know and hear about and kind of just hear, you know, what they are, how they exist, like where we're going to find them in the garden, how to maybe potentially identify which is which. So let's start with squirrels and chipmunks. Now I'm going to tell you something extremely embarrassing in the spirit of this podcast where like I have zero shame. So like literally maybe until I was 26, I thought that chipmunks were baby squirrels. Like I thought they were the same. I thought they, so I thought cute. chipmunks were baby squirrels. That just made sense to me. <laughs> I never second guessed. Nope, they're different. They're different animals. And so I feel like they're the biggest thing, especially in suburbia, like they're freaking everywhere. So how do we know a squirrel's been in our garden? And is there any special ways to mitigate that? Well, okay. So squirrels, actually, they're in your garden, period. They are. Yeah. Like just count they're on everywhere. that. Yeah. They're everywhere. They're tree rats, as some people call them. Okay. Chipmunks tend, and not exclusively, but chipmunks tend to be more urban dwelling, whereas oh, squirrels tend to be a bit more suburban. It's <laughs> not entirely. There are a lot of cases where you have both, but, you know, in a general sense, they do live and eat very similar things. So their main thing is they forage berries and nuts. They do eat some insects. Even, you know, squirrels, I was actually surprised when I really started researching to write the book on the chapter in the book on animals is that didn't actually realize squirrels can eat frogs. Like here in North Carolina, we have a lot of different amphibians, including small lizards like skinks and squirrels feed on those, which I had no idea. So they're, wow. they're omnivores. They, they kind of eat plants and animals. Um, and chipmunks do the same. Chipmunks are significantly smaller. Yes. And in a lot of ways, chipmunks actually are a little they cause a bit more damage mm -hmm. because they they both like to dig. They, they, they like to store their food away for the winter, which is primarily what gardeners complain about. Acorns being planted and plants being ripped out of your container gardens, you know, because of a squirrel or a chipmunk was in there, you know, trying mm -hmm. to bury whatever nut it's wanting to stash. Mm -hmm. Chipmunks just tend to live in larger colonies. So you have more. Okay. But, you know, I, of all the animals, it's sort of hard to get mad at either of them long term because they're awfully cute and you see them scurrying around in the trees. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's just kind of a nice reminder that we do have these other species that have adapted really easily to coexisting with us. Mm hmm. Now, for treatment of those, I have a couple suggestions. Number one, if, if squirrels are like, if they're getting into your bird food, for instance. So mm -hmm. a lot of times people attract these animals because of our outreach to what we like to call beneficial wildlife, which basically is exclusively birds. Yeah. 
So we feed the birds, but then we get mad that the other animals who eat the same things mm -hmm. also visit. And mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense. We're just, again, we're not really thinking critically about this entire concept of ecosystem. We just want to see the blue jays, baby. Right. That's all we care about. <laughs> we, yeah, we want to be very species specific. Yeah. You know, there are certainly bird feeders, number one, that are effective at knocking the squirrels or chipmunks away, making your bird feeders, you know, hang really in a way where they just can't even access it, like from mm -hmm. jumping from a branch that helps. But the addition of pepper, hot pepper. So, you know, a lot of people, especially beginning gardeners, I know I did this in my early days growing. I got like every variety of hot pepper that mm -hmm. I could find, not thinking about the reality that my body doesn't want all of that hot pepper <laughs> inside of it. Okay. And so it was like, oh my God, what do I do with, you know, all these habaneros and all these Carolina Reapers? Like I am not a 20 year old boy with something mm -hmm. to prove. So what do I do with these? So I still think they're great to grow because they're beautiful and you get a lot of yield. What you do is you let those dry, like you can dehydrate them or you can set them in the sun and allow them to dry and then food process that so that they're kind of in a dust and you add that to your bird feed and that will keep the mammals who actually have taste buds from eating your bird seed and it won't inhibit the birds from being able to eat. Huh. Super easy solution. You can just use something that's kind of impractical from your garden, mm -hmm. you know, so that you're not wasting those peppers. And it's to me that that has really transformed my activity at my bird feeders. So, cool. you know, and then you can also use that ground up pepper to add to, say, like a deer repellent, or if you make your own repellents, you can add that. And that will, again, help with these browsing mammals and, and pretty specifically deer, rabbits, groundhogs, squirrels, chipmunks are really offended by that pepper flavor. So most of the repellents that you're going to buy are either, they either include garlic, they include mint, or they include pepper. And the ones that work the best have all of those ingredients mixed. Can you get, if you don't grow the peppers and dehydrate them, can you buy cayenne pepper in bulk and just grind Absolutely. it up in your coffee grinder and then pop it in? Absolutely. And you can buy pre-dried peppers in usually like in the Hispanic aisle at grocery stores. So, okay. And then uh, what about peppermint oil? Peppermint oil is very effective. And again, that's usually one of the active ingredients in the common repellents. The advantage that peppermint oil has is, you know, it's long lasting, it's a strong smell. And I think human beings are the only ones who like the flavor of mint. And animals just, they hate it. Now, you know, growing mint in the ground can get a little tricky because it's oh my God, yeah. real invasive. You know, it's, it really is probably going to be the plant that lives on Mars. Mm -hmm. But using that mint oil, that mint scent, is a great way to be able to, you know, discourage these animals from eating something that would otherwise be delicious. Now, I don't, I've never really had any experience using peppermint oil, like on bird seed. Usually just the incorporation of pepper flakes is what they mm -hmm. do. Like I started doing this for myself because I was buying bird seed with pepper incorporated and paying a lot for it. And mm -hmm. I was like, wait, wait, I can do this. I, right? I can do this. I have the solution for this. My mom actually successfully in other years, she collects seashells and she lines her garden beds with seashells just because it looks pretty. Yeah. And she'll take a huge like Home Depot big bucket and make a peppermint oil solution and then soak the seashells in the solution. That's and then line brilliant. the beds with the, sea with the peppermint soaked seashells. And I thought that was super interesting. I'm going to do that. I also collect seashells. Oh, cool. gives me a new thing to do. Yeah. I've heard people say they, they, they soak rags in it mm -hmm. and then they hang the rags, you know, in strategic areas of their garden. And that, that also helps. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's easy enough to just re reapply if you're getting a lot of rain. And that's actually one step simpler than having to make the spray and apply it to the plants. Yeah. Which, you know, can be problematic, particularly on food crops. Like it's 
one thing to spray ornamental plants that you have no intention of eating, but do you really want your food crops to have that like strong scent on it Pepper when or pe- you're or mint, planning yeah. to eat it? You know, are there any any strategies for dealing with squirrels or chipmunks digging and burying? Like, is there anything you can do to your garden bed to make them not do that? So there are a couple things and. You know, I sometimes have these aha moments. Like, did it seriously take me 41 years to come up with this? <laughs> steel wool, steel okay. wool that you clean pots and pans with, right? You mm-hmm. buy it at the store. It's like 99 cents a pack. You can use that strategically around plants and they don't like metal getting into their claws. So you can literally just use steel wool scrubbers as a mulch and you will not have them dig around at all. So I started doing that in my containers because I have a bigger squirrel issue like in my pots than actually oh my god that's my ground and so it looks really pretty because it's silver and it you know it kind of looks flashy when the sun hits it and it's I love that will you send a picture of that yeah definitely that's such an easy solution and I mean other people have recommended you know putting a layer of gravel down so you know pea gravel or permatil which is kind of an expanded It's like this expanded gravel and that's kind of sharp and they don't like that on their, on their paws. You can do that in ground or in containers. And I've also recently started using a product called Volking, Volking bags. So these things are so ingenious and they work for more than just voles. So, you know, that's the thing. They're really, they work great in ground because they protect that central root zone from voles eating those roots. But if you use these you're you're pulling the metal up to the crown of the plant so again when a chipmunk or a squirrel goes to dig they get a a claw full of that volking metal and they don't like that texture and so they trot away so there's like a couple of different reasons to use the volking bags as a first line of defense for both in ground animals and above ground And so sorry, that bag, is that like a contraption that you're actually putting in the earth and then planting the plant in it? Yeah. So basically the way I do it, you would put your plant in the Volking bag and then you plant the entire thing bag with the plant inside into the hole in the ground. And then you just cover it up and you never do anything to it again. It doesn't- the roots grow out of the bag? Yeah, the roots grow out, but what it really protects is that that central tap root zone, that really mm-hmm. critical area. And it's like the simplest, easiest solution. Now, it's not a solution for everything you already have planted, but it is a solution for anything that you're going to be buying. Like your pretty annuals, you don't want like torn up or something. Yeah, or, or you know, bulb displays. And, you know, if you want to have a pretty display of tulips, but you're, you're concerned about voles eating the bulbs, you could plant your tulips in the Volking bag and they'll be protected. And certainly people oh, who wow. grow hostas, the, the hostas and Volking bags should, frankly, they should just be sold together. That's wow. You know, yeah. Because we had a Patreon plant friend write in Daniel. He wants to know how to prevent squirrels from digging up bulbs because last year he tried trillium and wild geranium and the squirrels ate all the bulbs. So you're saying is the best the best option is trying the bulbs in a Volking. Yes, do it in a Volking. And the difference between the Volking bag versus say like chicken wire, the holes are significantly smaller. They're they're large enough for roots to grow through, but there's no way that an animal is going to be able to rip it apart. Um, so yeah, it's it's just an ingenious product that was created by a landscaper who was just so beat down from mm-hmm. animals eating the plants that he was installing. And so he took that frustration and made a fantastic product out of that. Oh my God. I freaking love that. That's amazing. 
If you listen to this podcast, you're likely a bit nerdy, a little bit of a deep diver with a passion to learn and grow with information that can be meaningful for your life. If this is you, plant friend, I suggest checking out another amazingly informative podcast. It's called Something You Should Know with Mike Carruthers. Every episode of Something You Should Know delivers fascinating information you can use in your life and help you understand the world better. Every episode, Mike talks with leading experts on topics that really affect us, like why you should embrace your most embarrassing moments. What causes coincidences? Weird things that really affect your health, understanding uncertainty, or the power of strangers. There is such a wide range of topics and guests, and they are always fascinating, so fun to listen to, and they will leave you a little smarter than you were before because Mike goes there. He asks questions that really get to the heart of the topic, the kind of questions that you or I would want to ask. Something You Should Know is a fun and entertaining podcast. It's got thousands of five-star reviews, and when you subscribe, you'll learn something new and useful in every episode. So give it a listen. I have a feeling you're going to love it. Search for Something You Should Know where you get your podcasts, and when you see the bright yellow bulb, start listening. You can thank me later. Something You Should Know. So let's talk about voles, because squirrels and chipmunks, at least they're cute. Oh my God. Moles, voles, and shrews are the freakiest looking things I've ever seen. No offense, but that's a freaky looking animal. Well, they are. And, you know, I recently realized that I have been congratulating my cats. So I have three cats who are, you know, relatively spoiled. They don't really catch any animals. They don't kill any animals, I should say, but they'll occasionally catch something. And the little critters that they've been catching that I thought were voles, they actually were shrews. And so I've had to, like, really come to terms with the fact that, like, shrews are good. You actually want shrews. They okay. don't eat your plants. They eat ticks. They eat mosquitoes. Like, shrews are on the good good side of little varmints, right? Voles, I don't think I've actually in person ever seen a vole, even though I have had a ton of plants die from vole damage. So yes. I know I have them. I just have yet to get my hands on one. When I was looking them up online, they really do look like they're from outer space. They've got these like bright yellow teeth, huge bulbous hands. They've yeah, got well, hands. now those are moles. So oh, here's the moles. thing. Okay. The voles don't actually have those paddles, so mm-hmm. the voles travel with the moles. <laughs> okay, so they team up. They team up. And they're now the moles, they're problematic because, you know, they do create these big tunnels, but they don't eat your plant roots. Moles are meat eaters. They only eat grubs, so they're primarily eating grub worms from Japanese beetles. But they'll eat other grubs as well. So they're tunneling to find the grubs. Yes. So the okay. easy solution for moles is to deal with the grubs. The solution for dealing with grubs is applying milky spore, which is a bacterium that will colonize in your property and inhibit the ability for grubs to develop. So okay. it's an organic, it's inexpensive. It's a very effective and easy approach. You don't have to put out any poison whatsoever. So, you know, that is great. But if you also have voles, milky spore isn't going to do anything to deter the voles. Now, I learned a few years ago from my extension agent, the reason that Americans are battling voles to the degree that we are now is our love affair with mulch. We, we Mm -hmm. all love mulch. We are, I don't know what's gone on the last 30 years, but we have fallen into a deep, deep adoration. And in all different colors, we're like, right? Yeah. All different textures. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the substrate that is ideal for voles to tunnel around in because they can't dig in hard packed clay, but they can tunnel around in that top layer of organic matter breaking down mulch. Mm -hmm. So she said to me, the number one thing, just use less mulch. Like if you just don't have so much of this wood chip breaking down, you're going to realize you're going to see a decline in the vole population just because they won't have access to where they live nearly as easily. And, you know, this is also for people who live in cold climates because vole populations explode with the insulation of snow. Snow is protecting that little root zone area that they live in, in that broken down mulch layer. So they're actually breeding and, you know, having lots and lots of babies 
when you don't even know that anything is going on because you've got snow on the ground. What? Yeah. So I've got two feet of snow all around my house right now. So the voles. The are, voles the are voles out there. Are just alive, tunneling around under my beautiful, quiet snow. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got some vol solutions that are really okay, tell awesome. Me. Tell me, so please. In addition to vol king bags, which okay, obvious, right? The best thing that I've come up with is planting garlic right along your bed edges. Uh-huh. Voles hate the smell of garlic. They don't like the smell of the bulb. So here's a win-win. You can grow all the garlic you'll ever need. You'll be able Mm -hmm. to share garlic with people. You'll look like a rock star for everyone. When really your only purpose was to keep the voles from eating the other plants in your garden. So garlic is the answer. So you can plant garlic like you do one clove of garlic under the soil and then that grows into a whole head. And that's enough? Just that one clove? No, you need to plant it as a row all along the edge. I recommend half an inch to three quarters of an inch spacing. So what you end up Her with- Per clove. So you've yes. got a nice little wall of A garlic. wall. You have an impenetrable barrier. Love yes. Love that. How deep under the soil? I don't plant my garlic deep. I uh, mm-hmm. actually am, I literally thumb it in. So what, a half an okay. inch? Mm-hmm. Now in colder climates, if you're fall planting, you're going to want to plant it a little deeper. But in colder regions, you can plant garlic in the spring when the snow melts. And then you have it as a line of defense all summer long. So I love that. yeah, it's such an easy, practical solution. You know, the thing with garlic, you can buy it at the grocery store. <laughs> you can right. plant the garlic from the store. You don't even have to buy a specialized variety, mm-hmm. though. I do recommend that you put some effort into seeing the types of garlic that are best for your region because there's so many different types of garlic. And really, homegrown garlic tastes so much better that once you have your own, you'll never want to buy it from the store to eat. So, yeah. this is such an easy, like, I love when I can come up with a like a, I call it a foodscape solution where mm-hmm. I, I get you to grow something you eat, but it also serves this other much greater purpose. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That reminds me, one of our sponsors is Territorial Seed Company and they have the most, the first time I worked with them was the first time I realized, I thought garlic was like all one variety. Like I had no idea hardscape and like I had no idea the wide variety of garlic, even as an Italian, I didn't understand. They had, you know, 40 different types of garlic on their website and I, all for different things. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. So I I tr- wanted to plant their garlic last year and I ended up moving. So I wasn't able to see it through the, you know, the season that it needs to go, but that's definitely on my agenda. For this year. Put that on your list. And I'd say just try every variety. You know, I have yeah. yet to find a variety of garlic I didn't like. Of but course. the great thing is no matter what cultivar you have, or if it's soft neck or hard neck, voles hate all of them universally. Mm-hmm. And I love the that. other advantage, rabbits and groundhogs don't like the foliage smell. So you've got an in-ground defense mechanism for voles. Above ground, that foliage is helping deter animals that browse that would come through and munch everything, you know, that you have planted in a bed. So the garlic really does double duty. And that really goes for all allium. So, you know, that's elephant garlic, that's shallots, chives, onions, what am I missing? Leeks. You know, it's not just garlic. It's anything in the allium family has this dual function for edibility, but deterring animals. Oh, I love that. If my fiance could have his way, we would do a full like three by four container of just onions. Like he loves leeks. (laughs) I've I've never seen someone eat more spring onions than him. So that's perfect. I'll do that. I'll line my bed. Now also with these burrowing pests, moles, voles, shrews we're going to leave out because we like the shrews. If I'm doing raised beds, do I have to worry about them as much? Well, you sort of do. They certainly have the capacity to come up into a raised bed from below ground and then Mm -hmm. just tunnel up. Taller raised beds, you know, raised beds that are more the height where you would be sitting on their edge Mm -hmm. tend to be a a little safer 
versus really shallow raised beds that oh, might okay. just like be like inches. one little bit of lumber that's, you know, raising it just a few inches. Got it. In those cases, no, you don't have any line of defense from a burrower. Got so it. get prepared. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. So I love this. Holy moly. I'm learning so much, Bree. Thank you. Okay. So we've got moles, bulls, and shrews. We've got squirrels versus chipmunks. What are the other, you mentioned rabbits and groundhogs. What do we need to know? What are the like above ground besides them? Did we miss any? Well, so deer, certainly deer. We'll get to deer. We have, yeah. I have a lot of you deer know, questions commonly, for you. Commonly, yeah, it's rabbits and groundhogs. I know like armadillos are on their way to me. They're about an hour south of me. Okay. And, you know, armadillos pose a different challenge in that they're also meat eaters like, like moles but they dig giant holes and they expose the roots of plants, which is in part what groundhogs do. Okay. So my first encounter with groundhogs was working at this estate and we just couldn't figure out like, what was eating this salvia? Like who eats salvia? Mm-hmm. Like who eats castor beans? That's, that's poison. You mm-hmm. know, well, groundhogs, <laughs> groundhogs. Wow. Eating and then they were simultaneously digging these monstrous holes because that's where they live. That's why they're called groundhogs. You know, and I think they have a couple other names like woodchucks and, you, you know, like people mm-hmm. are referring to the same animal, just sort of mm-hmm. regional names for them. The bottom line is they're large. They're really not afraid of people. Like they have definitely evolved mm-hmm. in time to realize that the American landscape is way more delicious than living out in nature. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to be afraid of you. They have families, like they have mates for life and they have many generations of babies and they all mm-hmm. live really close to one another. I have family in Pittsburgh that we always laugh because like no one ever leaves Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. They actually, because of Punxsutawney Phil, they feel really you know, connected to groundhogs. So we call them the groundhog family because, you know, they all just like move in next to one another. And then you have an entire family that fills the whole neighborhood. (laughs) And that's precisely how groundhog communities behave. So your best bet with groundhogs are going to be live traps. And typically as a homeowner, you might just want to hire a trapping company to come in because they're going to better understand where to place the traps. And then they have permits for releasing them in locations that are, you know, legal and safe. Whereas Mm -hmm. it's actually illegal, at least in the state of North Carolina, for a home gardener to relocate a a groundhog. Interesting. So yeah, if you catch it and then you release it a few miles away in a forest and a forest ranger catches you, you could get a ticket. So I generally recommend for groundhogs, you know, if if your decision is that you absolutely can't live with them, and in my experience gardening, you really can't. You can't coexist with groundhogs. They just do so much damage that it'll drive you to find a new hobby. So live, live traps, have a heart traps are usually the best route. So what's the difference if I am looking at a garden bed that's been ravaged? What's the difference between what a groundhog will look like and what a squirrel will look like? Not the animal, but their damage. So it's pretty significant. Groundhog okay. damage is really all encompassing. Like when you were describing that it looked like all of the greens had been mowed down, I mm-hmm. would suspect that was either a herd of deer or a family of groundhogs. But okay. squirrels would never do that much damage. Okay. So typically with groundhogs, and it's really funny is I follow a groundhog on YouTube. <laughs> His name is Chunk, and it's one of the cutest YouTube channels that you'll ever see. Shout um, out to Chunk. Chunk, <laughs> Chunk, Chunk the, groundhog. the groundhog. He like goes right up to the camera as he's stealing all of the, the produce from their garden. And it's nice that they're trying to, you know, make it make a positive out of what most of us would consider a negative. But I've learned a lot about groundhog behavior as a result of Chunk mm-hmm. the groundhog <laughs> and my watching him in the evenings. <laughs> And they tend to devour what they eat 
and then they just sort of discard this the scraps. So like if they got if they decided to eat, uh, I have a cat here freeze who doesn't cat, do anything freeze cat, about just like photo bombed our, our conversation. <laughs> like a groundhog, if they go and eat a tomato, they're gonna eat three quarters of the tomato. Like they mm. they really don't waste very much. Whereas squirrels will often just take a bite out of every single tomato. Why Which hurts asshole. your feelings because yeah. you go out there thinking, oh, I've got this great harvest. And then you pick it and you realize that like it's half rotten because a squirrel got to it 20 hours before you did. Right, 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 right. Oh my Groundhogs, goodness. to their credit, are not as wasteful. So mm -hmm. that's something. But in saying that, they're going to eat everything. They really have very few things that they don't like, particularly that are in a cultivated home vegetable garden space. Like garlic is one thing. They don't like the smell of allium. They don't like the flavor of arugula or mustard. So again, those are crops that you can plant around the edge to mm -hmm. sort of give yourself a little insurance policy. And then, you know, sometimes the best thing to do is set up a wildlife camera so you know what's happening when you're not there. So then you actually see who's visiting your garden. Yeah. And then you can make better decisions about how to go about dealing with them. Now, is that a thing? A wild can I buy that on the internet? Can I Google wildlife camera and that comes up? You can. They're actually, they're really common now. I think the pandemic has driven more and more people to okay. boredom and <laughs> wanting to watch 100 this. 100% get one. I have a friend in downtown Atlanta who in their neighborhood, they were having a lot of problems with raccoons getting into garbage cans. And so his solution was to feed the raccoons because if the raccoons are fed, they're not going to get into your garbage. Well, it's mm -hmm. been a fantastic solution. And he set up all of these cameras so he can watch the raccoons and possums that visit his urban garden every single night. And I stayed there uh, right before the pandemic. And we actually stayed up until like four o'clock in the morning watching the raccoons and possums oh. have their turns at the different water dishes. And, you know, they get like, they get the leftover or the discarded produce from the local grocery store. And they eat you know, things like grapes and melons and bread. That's and... so funny. <laughs> yeah. That's like next level. Like that's, that's like, you know, new parents when they have the baby camera, like that's next level. Oh my God. That's so funny. Okay, plant friends, you have heard me talk about how much I love Wally Grow and their sustainable, eco-friendly planters for years on this podcast and on my social media. Their planters are all over my house. Their ridiculously easy to install eco planters are what make up the epic green wall that I had in my last apartment, which was so amazing. And their newer loop planters are my new go-to tabletop planters because of their super sleek, drip-free design, which I'm in love with. Wally Grow has just launched the most gorgeous new line of spring colors just in time for a spring decor refresh, a little spring makeover, or maybe even your patio setups because you can use them indoors and outdoors. So I'm going to break down all these colors for you. So the first new color is mustard, which is a gorgeous shade of yellow, and it's such a playful combination with your plant leaves. The new forest green color is my favorite because I think a forest green eco planter would make the most amazing green wall because that deep green is going to match and blend with the green of your plants and it's just going to be like a full wall of green. I'm in love. And then the oak color is a softer white that makes blending in with like a more neutral decor super easy and seamless and then last but not least the navy is like pure luxury with this like super rich luxe blue hue and lately I've been playing a lot with pairing blue and green more in my new home. For newbies who haven't heard me wax poetic about these planters here are just a few things you got to know besides the fact that they're sleek and gorgeous. They're super thoughtfully designed so they have water reservoirs that feeds the root directly and helps you conserve water. They're leak proof. They have breathable panels to promote optimal root health. If you want a green wall I really can't recommend the Ecos enough. The installation is unbelievably easy. You literally just drill in one hole to hang the planter on. Speaking of hanging, the loop planter was their solution to hanging planters because it comes with natural macrame rope that you can hang in several different really stylish ways, but it's drip proof. And I actually don't use the loop planters as hanging planters in my home. I use them as my tabletop planters because I really like the design and I really like that I can trust that I'm not going to like leak water everywhere. Wally Grow is offering a limited time 15% off discount to our community only from May 11th to May 18th. So plant friends, they don't offer 
offer discounts a lot. So if you wanted to buy any of these planters, go to wallygrow.com this week. Use code BAGR15 for 15% off and let me know how you style them in your own home. Okay, plant friends, this episode is so perfectly suited for our partner, Deer Busters. (laughs) wildlife fencing. If you're struggling with deer and wildlife in your garden, which you probably are if you're listening to this episode, it's really time to consider a deer fence. They're the easiest, most humane, most I think practical way to keep animals out and Deer Busters makes it easy to get a deer fence on your property because none of us want anybody munching on the fun veggies that we're growing except for us, right? And listen, plant friends, when I moved upstate, I had no idea of the struggles that local gardeners up here have to go through. You know, once I connected with local gardeners, they were all saying that it's really important to have sturdy, tall deer fencing. It's really just the number one way to set yourself up for success if you live in a rural area with animal pressure. And if you follow my Instagram, you know that I'm obsessed with these adorable deer just jumping all over my property with their cute little cotton tails, but I don't like them enough to share my lettuce and tomatoes with them. So Deer Busters makes planning and installing your garden easy with their fence kits. They come with all the materials that you need to build the fence. They make it easy for you and the fence kits can be custom Customizable by linear feet, corners, ends if you want gates, tensioning, or extra rodent barriers. And they require no professional installation or fancy tools. Anyone can do it, and you get everything you need to install it. So if you're looking to set up a deer fence of your own, you should check out Deer Busters. You can visit DeerBusters.com today to protect your plants tomorrow and use code BLOOM at checkout for 10% off. Once again, that's code BLOOM at checkout for 10% off at DeerBusters.com. Our Patreon plant friend Tina says, I think I understand the concept of a trap crop where one plant is used to lure pests to let others of its kind thrive relatively pest-free. But how is it usually put into practice? Are there certain plants of which it works better than others? So that's a great question. And that's actually more to do with insects rather than animals. Although I love the idea of taking that concept and applying it to animals. Mm -hmm. So essentially feeding them what they want so that they're, at least in theory, satisfied, Mm -hmm. and then they will leave your other plants alone. I don't know that it totally works that way with animals because I think sometimes maybe they nibble a little bit here that that tends to be what I see they they start in this spot and then they they trot over here and they try something else and you know so they move throughout your garden and so I'm not Mm -hmm. exactly sure that having one isolated location will be the most effective but those trap crops are really effective for controlling insects so in the nursery industry what we would do is have say like a banker plant that is known to attract aphids. And so the aphids all go to those banker plants Mm -hmm. and then they're not interested in the ornamental crop that we're trying to cultivate to sell therefore reducing our need for applying a pesticide. And so, you know, you'll see that a lot of times, particularly in nurseries now, as they are implementing integrated pest management biocontrol methods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're making sure they're not applying any broad spectrum pesticide because those pesticides kill the bad bugs, but they also kill the good bugs. And so the best way to keep that in balance is to purposely grow plants that bad bugs are attracted to so that you have those concentrated, and then those bad bugs actually attract the beneficial insects that will come in and eat those problem insects. So like, you know, aphids are a great example. Even people with house plants deal with aphid infestations and lady beetle larvae are the best way to control aphids because mm-hmm. the lady beetle larva will eat all the aphids in typically 22 hours. Mm -hmm. So it's a really quick way to deal with it and you're not having to apply soap or oil or or anything like that. That's so interesting. Wow. Billy, my fiance the other day asked if we could get some lady beetles to deal with. Well, our lime tree just is struggling with scale, which I don't even think lady beetles, do they even eat scale? I don't think so. But he just like, he was like, let's just get a bunch of ladybugs and like be done with it. And I'm like, that's not how uh, it works really. And so also we're renting. Scale, <laughs> you would want to get mites. There are mites, right. beneficial mites that would do that. But really on a lime tree at this time of year, I would just recommend dormant oil or, you know, neem oil. 
poor guy got in the bathtub with a bunch of Q-tips and a peroxide solution, just scrubbing away with, oh no, with a toothbrush. Anyway, that's another story for a different day. He's very sweet. Oh, that's dedication. <laughs> yes, he's very attached to Limey, our lime tree. But anyway, so, okay. Any other pests besides deer that we didn't cover? Oh, rabbits. Yeah, rabbits, I think, you know, are just... Rabbits. They're inevitable and they're so cute. And last year we we had a really long, mild spring. I think they had about six generations of rabbits. It's like everyone here in the Southeast was just reporting record rabbit damage. My cats have, I think, significant friendships with rabbits. Okay. They don't chase them. In fact, they almost like go out into the garden and guard the rabbits to make sure that nobody else spooks the bunnies, you know? So <laughs> That's funny. My, one of my biggest challenges in my garden is rabbits that mm. mow down everything. And since my cats have been proven to be, you know, they're pacifists, I, I should mm-hmm. say. Like, they love zooming with their tail right in the right. middle. I've learned, you know, a few tricks with rabbits. One thing is my repellent that I just find is super useful is I must garden. Okay. And the reason I like that one, it's mammal specific. So it's important to note like deer repellent doesn't necessarily work on other animals. It's mm-hmm. for deer. So I must garden is a a product line that has a specific concoction for every creature. So there's a snake repellent, armadillo, dog and cat. Like a lot of times people ask me like, how do you keep your cats from digging in your gardens? And I put the the cat repellent out in my beds and that prevents them from using my garden as a litter box. I don't want them to do that. So the rabbit repellent has been really my ace in the hole for bunnies. You know, having these strategic plantings you know, things like, like I mentioned, the, the garlic, the arugula, the mustard, also potatoes. Potatoes are a really good plant pairing. Again, right along your bed edges. They're in the nightshade family. They're poisonous foliage. And the rabbits, the deer, the groundhogs, they know instinctively not to eat those. So once they smell that, They tend to dart across and really, I'm just trying to get these animals to go to my neighbor's yards. I'm not getting rid of them. I'm just directing them to someone else's house who doesn't garden. So they're not offended when their hydrangea gets eaten to the ground. And and that's been a really good strategy for me. This combo of planting my edges on purpose, like for Mm -hmm. the summer season, the really smelly basils, like the dwarf globe basil. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a basil that you want to make pesto from because it's a really kind of weird smell. It's small. tiny leaves, yeah. To me, it smells like burning hair. Mm -hmm. Rabbits hate it. I've seen it firsthand where the rabbits come up and they sniff it. And it's almost like they give me the double middle finger and then they run to my neighbors. (laughs) Wow. Cool. Okay. Very effective strategy along with using that I must garden repellent, especially in the spring and applying it regularly. Don't read the labels on any of these things. In the spring, when plants are flushing, you have to apply repellent all the time because if you applied it and then new leaves came out, those new leaves don't have the protection of the repellent. So that's where and I- how do you apply, is it a spray that you spray actually on the foliage of the plants? It is. So they have both, they have granular and spray. Okay. I have found the spray is a bit more effective, especially in the spring when the rabbits are, they're rapidly for multiplying. Salad, baby. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so what I like about the I Must Garden is it's safe for applying on food crops. Of course, you want to clean, you want to make sure you wash anything mm-hmm. that you spray, but you can spray it on, you know, things like lettuce or Swiss chard or kale. Okay. And the rabbits don't like to eat it. Okay. Wow. Okay. So it's this combination of choosing the right plants and also using some products. If you really do have an issue using getting the right products for the right pests. So it's interesting. You talk about that camera because I could see that a lot of people might think that they have one pest and treat for that pest and it's actually something else. And then you're like even more lost, even more money with the plants gone and the investment in the pest eradication. Wow. Okay. And, you know, one, one recommendation, which is always a little bit funny to bring up, but 
if you don't get the camera to see who's out there, look for their little piles of scat. Yeah, totally. Uh, they all have slightly different size pellets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is one thing. And, and I don't really want to ever see a record of my Googling because mm -hmm. it's absurd. But I Googled today the difference between rabbit pellets and deer pellets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Google has the answer for you. Of course. <laughs> She's always there to help. Yes. Okay. Now we move to me and my big problem that I'm trying to solve for myself because I moved to the Catskills. There's a huge deer overpopulation up here. And I've been really worried about planting a garden and then just attracting all this deer and then their ticks. Because yes. apparently, because there's so many deer in our area, there's been an abundance of ticks in our area. So let's talk deer. <laughs> well, I can tell you, first of all, that that is a real problem and it yeah. should be taken seriously. And in your area in particular, you have a lot of pressure. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's something to really be considerate of. And to that point, I think that you're on the right track with getting a fence. But an interesting thing that I learned about deer too, is that you can't just put up like a chicken wire fence or like, you know, a three foot fence from Home Depot. Like those things jump. Yes. They jump high. Yeah. The thing with deer, they're, they have bad depth perception. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to install a low fence, say, because their homeowner association doesn't allow for a 10 foot tall fence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, my dream fence is 10 foot tall with two foot of wire buried so that groundhogs mm -hmm. and rabbits can't nice. get in. Yeah. And it's so tall that nobody can jump over. Right. Love that. But I don't live in a, I live in a neighborhood with restrictions and I, I'm like, like straight up not allowed to do that. So for dealing with deer in a in a neighborhood setting, what you can do is set up a series of low fences that are close together. So instead mm -hmm. of, you know, you think of a fence as just being a barrier. So instead you identify where the deer come walking every day. Deer, the advantage you have with combating deer is they are creatures of habit. Mm-hmm. They literally like to sleep in the same spot and walk the same trail and eat from the same general vicinity day in and day out. Mm -hmm. So you can start to see what their habits are and then strategically place low fencing, but over the course of say six or seven foot deep. Mm -hmm. So the way I do that, I use in the winter season, my cattle fence panels that I use for tomato cages in the summer, mm -hmm. I strategically put those out in the areas where the deer like to walk to block them from coming in their normal pathways. And I put three in a row, right? So not three next to one another, but three behind each other. Like three deep. Three deep. So then they see that and they can't see a clear area where they would land. So they don't try to jump over it. Mm -hmm. So that's where like the idea of hedges, living hedges, you know, like an arborvitae hedge or a holly hedge. Deer don't tend to jump over those because they can't see beyond it. Interesting. And so that's where you start to be able to employ some creativity. In my case, I don't leave those cattle fences in that orientation year round, but I put them there in the fall when I'm not growing tomatoes anymore. And then I move them around now and again through the winter, just to make sure that the deer know they really aren't welcome here. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Also, I've in looking at the deer fence that I got, I also wanted to make sure that just the space, even though mine's tall, I want to keep it confined. Like I just want my containers in the space. So it's not even a lot of space for them to jump in and then jump out. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with deer fence, you'll actually see the top is sort of on a diagonal, like a 45 degree mm -hmm. a diagonal. And that again is there just for the, the essence of the deer not being able to see beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's, there are, there are ways to get around the deer, even though mm -hmm. I would venture to say that nine out of 10 American gardeners have deer in their, right in their realm, you know, whether you're, whether you're mad at the deer or you're charmed by them, they're, they're pretty much basically like the dogs of nature. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> so what about if we can't have, so in my fence research, that's definitely come up the depth perception that you've got to get a really tall fence because they'll jump over it. And also hanging streamers from your fence because sometimes deer can't actually see the fence. So you hang these like little warning streamers on the fence. So the deer know if they're running to like slow down. Right. Yes. And you know, streamers or I mean, nowadays who uses CDs, right. Mm -hmm. It's all about light flashing. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I always would recommend you know, especially in the fall, not so much to deal with deer on a fence, but when the deer are in rut or they're rubbing the the velvet off of their antlers, Mm -hmm. you know, that's when they attack and do a lot of damage to, you know, expensive trees, like especially grafted Japanese maples. They Mm -hmm. seem to know exactly where the graft union is and that's where they rub their antlers and break the plant. And then Mm -hmm. what you're left with is understock that isn't really the tree that you bought. And so dangling a silver sort of ribbon or CDs, even like, what are those things that blow in the wind that go in circles that we used to play with? Oh, like a pinwheel. My mom has pinwheels all over her garden. Yes. Pinwheels. pinwheels, Yeah. Actually have a function and that's Mm -hmm. their function. It's to scare deer away. Mm -hmm. I've also seen people, which I thought was really pretty, hang the metal things that you would put in place of a gutter, you know, like the rain chains, mm-hmm. but hang those in trees to deter the deer from coming around. And I've seen that specifically in orchards where they're trying to preserve their apples, you know, so they can be harvested and not eaten exclusively by deer. Oh my God. Remember deer will also stand on their hind leg and then they're really tall so they can eat high in the air. So, you know, there's not only can they jump, but they can actually kind of walk on two legs and they eat almost everything or they're willing to try almost everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even the plants that people love to claim are deer proof that might not be their first choice, but when push comes to shove, they still might eat it. Well, let's talk about that. So is there a deer proof plant? Is there such a thing? I try to say, I try not to ever claim that. There's definitely plants that have grown that the deer haven't enjoyed. Like castor bean is a great annual plant that that the deer steer clear of. Verbena bonariensis, which is a, another really nice summer flowering plant. They don't like that. It's It does tend to be plants that are furry. They have like a a furry-ish texture to their leaves or to their stem. That tends to not be their first decision. They love hostas. They love hydrangeas. They love heuchera. So Mm -hmm. I usually recommend like just try not growing things that start with an H. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. So maybe it's not about finding a deer proof plant. It's about finding the plants that deer really like and then not growing them. Yes. Or not having a garden that is dependent on those plants exclusively. You know, Mm -hmm. I know coming from zone five, hostas are a a huge part of the landscape and it's discouraging for people because the voles eat the roots and the deer eat the the shoots. And, you know, the home gardener is kind of left in a place of feeling very underwhelmed. And, Mm -hmm. but there are other plants out there that, that can be an alternative, you know, and like I've mentioned salvia several times. Salvia is a plant that, you know, has a really strong scent and deer don't tend to like that. A lot of herbs, things like rosemary and oregano, dill, mint, sage, all these things that that humans like to eat for culinary purposes, the deer tend to steer away from. I want to give a shout out to Karen Chapman just published a book called Deer Resistant Design. Yes. And she doesn't believe in fences. She just believes in designing your garden to make deer not tear it apart. And so if people want to dive more into like the plants that deer will be deterred from and like how to make a deer resistant garden, I highly suggest that book. I recommend that as well. That is my number one, that and the new book from Ruth Rogers-Clausen. My two recommendations that are 
in my webinar. They're just great resources that apply to people all over North America. So they're, you know, not too regionally specific, which is important. Okay. And then what about like sprays? I feel like I see a lot of like deer sprays, like deer things. Like, do those work? They do. They do work. They're going to work, you know, better, I think, in the fall and winter when your plants aren't growing as fast. So, you know, they the really great repellent, something like Deer Away or Liquid Fence, they're very effective, but they're also expensive. You know, they're about $125 a gallon. You buy them concentrate and then you mix your own batches. But then you have to store all that concentrate and, you know, not everybody has has a storage shed and not everybody wants to mix their own. I recommend using those sprays in the fall when the plants are going dormant and then they last a lot longer. And then I switch to using I Must Garden deer repellent in the spring when everything is breaking dormancy and it's less expensive. It doesn't last as long, but because the cost effectiveness, I can Mm -hmm. justify spraying it once a week. And, you know, making sure that all that new growth is protected. Got it. You mentioned I Must Garden has the different types of like cat, deer, groundhog, whatever. If you want to treat for a few of them, do you like mix it all up together and spray at once or do you spray different levels? I spray different levels. I'm sure you probably could mix them together, although that might really smell crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, (laughs) Okay. But I usually tend to, you know, I just sort of think of it like today I'm going to spray for rabbits and tomorrow I'm going to spray for deer. And I try not to let animal control be a thousand percent of my attention because then I'll start resenting the experience of gardening. Mm -hmm. And most of all, I want to preserve the joy that gardening brings me. Yeah. And so I try to make it really convenient. Like I keep a small sprayer. I use a one gallon sprayer instead of a big three gallon backpack sprayer. I keep it on my front porch tucked behind an Adirondack chair. So when I walk out to the mailbox, I can grab it and it's not inconvenient for me to go ahead and treat the plants that I know are either likely to get eaten or already have been munched on. And so then it it. never really feels like an imposition. And this is coming from me having worked as a full-time gardener where I used, there used to be days where I sprayed deer repellent for eight hours a day Mm -hmm. and uh, we made our own and this is a good repellent. It doesn't last very long, but it's one egg, one gallon of water, one tablespoon of hot sauce. We always use Tabasco sauce Mm -hmm. and one tablespoon of Dawn dish detergent. Now the critical thing here is to add the Dawn last. Okay. Cause okay. otherwise it gets foamy and you make a complete mess. Okay. <laughs> but so you mix all of that together and then you can apply that to plants and deer don't like that concoction. Wow. Um, so, you know, if you have a lot of land and you don't want the expense of buying a repellent, that, that is one that I highly recommend. And then you can always add other elements to it. Like you can add apple cider vinegar if you're treating plants that are getting eaten and they have powdery mildew. So you can, mm-hmm. you know, add this extra benefit. Or if it's a plant that, you know, deer and squirrels are also eating, uh, you know, add some of that dried pepper. pepper in addition to the Tabasco sauce. So, you know, there are a lot of really fun home remedies for this as well. And I, I just feel like, you know, the, the topic of this is so great because it's something that unifies all gardens. Everyone. Like, Everyone's always, it, and maybe it's a different animal, but everybody's dealt with it for sure. Exactly. We, we can all commiserate together. There's, there's really no one that's figured it all out and there's nobody that's immune to it. And so I think that's a really great, even playing field because totally. you can be a beginner, you can be an expert and we're still basically in the same place. <laughs> totally. So I know we're, we're already at an hour, but I, I had two more questions for you. One, for a beginning gardener, what doesn't work? Like what are some rookie mistakes you see people seeing? Cause they like read it on the internet and thought it would be cool. Okay. Number one, do not string fishing line up at ankle height. Okay. I have a funny story. I don't know that it's funny. I mean, it's funny cause it wasn't me, but so my parents have moved to 
they've retired from Michigan to South Carolina and they, you know, live around a bunch of retired people. And this lady at Strung Fishing Line, you know, clear fishing lines, you don't see it Mm -hmm. all over her yard. And it was really funny because we were walking and I was like, oh, look, look how ineffective that is. The the hostas have been eaten on both sides of the fishing line. So like Mm -hmm. clearly the deer were smart enough just to step over it. Right. Mm. Unfortunately, her husband didn't see it. He tripped. He fell. He broke his hip. He landed in rehab. Oh and I'm God. like, well, maybe that was what she was aiming for. Oh my I don't gosh. Know. I hope not. But you know, don't do that. That's just like an insurance claim waiting. That's a bad idea. And it doesn't work. You, you're not really achieving anything from stringing fishing line up. Uh, plus, fishing line is terrible for the environment. So keep it on your fishing pole and out of okay. your garden. Okay. And to the same point, I say that about the netting. I see a lot of landscape contractors putting netting out and low to the ground And granted, it will keep the deer or rabbits from eating whatever plant is underneath, but it's a huge detriment to the other beneficial animals that live in in our developed world, and particularly with snakes. And I've had a few occasions where I've had to cut snakes out of the netting, the landscape netting, and stressful. I am not a snake person, but you know, black rat snakes are a huge benefit to us. They eat the voles. We want right. the snakes, you know, right, they right, don't right. do any damage to our gardens. And so it, I, I don't recommend putting the netting out. I know a lot of times people recommend netting your blueberries to keep the birds from eating all of them. My suggestion is just plant more blueberries mm-hmm. and then you don't have to worry about getting a bird caught in the net, which also occurs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, for me, it's more like, again, and going back to Nancy and the humane gardener and the, the great advice that she shares about land stewardship goes beyond not not putting chemicals in the ground. It also goes to, you know, recognizing that we're just one part of the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And we aren't on top of it. We are an actual part of it. And that we need to be respectful of the other creatures that walk on this planet and who walk much more gently than we do. And yeah, I just think that we can all learn a lot from maybe setting our expectations a little lower Yeah, (laughs) and recognizing that, you know, none of us home gardeners are depending exclusively on the crops that we grow. So if an animal comes in, have the perspective that it's not the end of the world and that you can still go to Wegmans and have the best day ever. Mm-hmm. They just totally. opened Wegmans here in North Carolina. Ah. So it's basically like going so to new. an amusement park for me. <laughs> that's so fun. I love that. <laughs> well, I think that's a beautiful place to end. I mean, I feel like I could talk to you for another hour and maybe we'll just have to have you back. One thing I did want to ask is what does your personal garden look like? Well, it's enormous. Mm-hmm. I have an acre size suburban lot. So I'm Amazing. really fortunate to have a lot of land. I cultivate the square footage of just over a quarter acre. Mm -hmm. And because I'm here in zone seven, I garden year round. I have amazing about 200 square feet of arugula that I harvest from daily that we eat. Uh, I have about a thousand cloves of garlic planted to keep those moles from eating everything else. And I do grow a lot of grains. So I have barley and wheat oats growing right now mixed in with poppies and larkspur to help prevent the deer and rabbit habits from eating my beloved wheat and barley crops, which we do eat. We eat the the wheat that we grow, we make bread and tortillas from, and we brew beer from the barley that we harvest. So, oh my God, that's so fun. So that brings us to tell us all the things we can do to find you. You're such an amazing educator. I definitely want to learn more from you. So you've got books. What else? Where can we find you? Well, my website is Brie, like the cheese, B-R-I-E, grows, plural, G-R-O-W-S dot com. I'm Brie the Plant Lady on Instagram and YouTube, and I just really enjoy sharing kind of daily updates to be able to help educate people and, and, you know, have some good humor about telling you what not to do. That's basically what my YouTube channel should be called. (laughs) 
how what not, not to, to do. Yeah. <laughs> And then I'm on Facebook also as Brie Grows. I'd love for you to have me back. And I, I hope post pandemic, if you can travel, you can come visit me here. I would we die. Can that would eat be a so homegrown fun. meal. <laughs> I would die. I would love to drink some of that beer with you. And yes. let's just count on it in 2021. I'll come visit that and we'll do a awesome. YouTube tour of your garden and it'll be epic. And also we'll link to your books in the show notes. But if you're interested in growing, grains. I mean, that was just a little, I feel like just a little teaser, but that just really perked my interest as I'm marrying a, a craft beer lover. So check out everything Brie has to offer. She's obviously so amazing. So thank you again, Brie, for being here and for helping me get my garden growing. <laughs> oh, you are so welcome. This was a sincere pleasure and I look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you so much, Brie. Oh my God, this 60 minute episode turned into a 90 minute episode real quick because man, I feel like I could have just kept talking to her more and more. She's so amazing. Definitely go check out. Brie has published several books of her own. They're linked in the show notes. She's such an awesome person. Follow her on Instagram, follow her YouTube channel. We're gonna have clips of this episode on my YouTube channel as well. And make sure to go give her some love because she really just gave our community so much amazing free information about how to set ourselves up for success. All right, this episode has been long enough. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. I hope you are finding moments of connection with yourself and your plants this week. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show. So thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your plant parent personality profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and and growradio.com slash personality. And you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month. And these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing. plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. 
There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 